Well, we're going to stay right there in Ephesians chapter 5, beginning at verse 22. We're going to talk about marriage. Marriage that reflects Christ. That's what this is about. Actually, I, I, the, the full title will be Marriage That Reflects Christ and His Church. But I thought that would be a little too long for you to put on a, on a CD or whatever we do now. But Marriage That Reflects Christ. You know, the problem with preaching messages like this in our day is that the world has a very, very different view of these things than what the Word of God does. Uh, what I'm going to say to you, and just even reading what Jim read, if I did nothing but just read what was said here, uh, it, you know, it's pretty clear. Uh, but the world sees it as outdated, old-fashioned. Uh, they see it as being male chauvinistic, uh, suppressive of women, that kind of thing. And to be honest with you, uh, uh, a lot of, uh, in a lot of our history, things like this have been abused to kind of uh, give a wrong view of what a husband is and what a wife is and what they should be. Uh, there's no sense in which this preaches the inequality of women as persons because that's not what this is about. Uh, you know, this doesn't say that women do not have equal rights. It doesn't say that if a woman does the same job as a man, she shouldn't receive equal pay, things like that. But it does have a proper order of things for the uh, uh, furtherance and the health of an institution that God set in order back in the garden between Adam and Eve called marriage and for the family. And the key to it all is found in verse 32 when he says, this is a great mystery. Now that's something God has to reveal. Something we don't know by nature. Because, and one of the problems, if we don't see it this way, it's because we're all so selfish. <laughs> now we're that way. And don't deny it, you know. Women, you too. Men, we're all selfish. You know, we want our way. Yeah. I do. I want my way. I wish y'all thought exactly the way I thought. In every way. And I, I don't want any disagreement, see. But, that's, but I, I'm, I've lived long enough to know that's just not the way it is, all right? But this is a great mystery that has to be revealed to us by God. And he says, I speak concerning Christ and the church. Now, that ought to perk our ears up about this thing of marriage, the relationship of, of men and women. But what is said here in these verses of marriage is said in the light of the knowledge of the relationship that Christ has with his church. Christ is called the bridegroom. The church is called the bride. Christ is called the husband. And the church is called the wife. And we see that. I read that in Isaiah 61.10 when he talked about, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness. That's his righteousness. The merits of his obedience unto death charged to the account of his people who are his bride collectively. The church collectively, we have his righteousness imputed to us. That means charged to us. That means accounted to us. That's a righteousness that he worked out on the cross to save his bride, to save his wife, to pay her dowry, to pay her debt. As her sins were charged to him, accounted to him, imputed to him, he died for those sins. And he put them away. And he brought forth a righteousness by which she could be accepted with God and be justified, forgiven of all of her sins, and made righteous in the sight of God. And so as a bridegroom decketh himself with, with ornaments, and as a bride adorneth herself with jewels. So this, this is not a new concept. It's not a New Testament concept. It, was, it goes all the way back to Genesis. Christ the husband, the church is wife. Yeah, I, I love this passage in 1 Corinthians 11. I'll just read this to you. 
But Paul was concerned with the people of God being diverted by false religion and false preachers off of the simplicity that is in Christ. Now that's, that word simplicity, this is in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 1. That simplicity is not just uh, simpleness in the sense of being simple tons. Uh, this simplicity is a singularity. And it's a single focus on the glory of the person and finished work of Christ for our whole salvation. And that's what I try to preach. Each time I stand behind this pulpit, I want you to look to Christ alone, singly. I don't want you to look here and there and me and all that. Look to Christ, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. And that's what salvation is. That's what Christianity, true Christianity is. It's not looking to the preachers, not looking to the pope, it's not looking to the priest, it's looking to Christ, our great high priest. I look to him for forgiveness by his blood. I don't look to myself and what I do or don't do. I look to him for justification, to be righteous in God's sight. I don't look to myself, don't look to you. He is the Lord my righteousness. And so that's the singularity, that's the simple uh, message, the simplicity. And so Paul uh, was concerned about these in Corinthians, the Corinthian church, by, because they were, uh, false preachers were trying to, trying to divert them from looking to Christ to looking at others, looking within. And here's what he says. Listen to how he puts it in verse 1 of 1 Corinthians 11. He says, Would to God you bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me. And he's talking about defending himself. But verse 2 is where I really want you to look at. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. I've espoused you to one husband. Now what does that mean? That means preaching the gospel. When I tell you, when any preacher or any witness tells you, that your whole salvation is wrapped up in Christ and you're to look to him, you're to believe in him, you're to rest in him, you're to love him and follow him. That's what that means. If the Holy Spirit comes and does a work of grace in your heart and in your mind, you're being espoused, engaged, married uh, uh, ultimately to one husband. And he's the one and only Savior. There's one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. There's none other name under heaven given among men which by, whereby we must be saved. Christ alone. That's, that's it. And the church, uh, you think about this. Uh, think about uh, how we can compare these things. Uh, the church, in its relationship to Christ as the bride, as the wife, and a woman who's married to a man. The church and that woman were formed out of the husband. In the Old Testament now, when Eve was created by God, she was created out of Adam. Adam was created first, and then she was created to be a helpmate. God took the rib of Adam, and out of the rib formed Eve, his wife. And Paul in other places will use this as a reason for submission. Now that word glares out at you, doesn't it? You know, wives submit. There's two words that glare out for, for, for uh, husbands. They say, they say, look at that, verse 1, uh, submit, you know. And it's like that's the only word in the whole daggone passage, but it's not. And then the wives, you look at that word love. That comes out, and uh, you know, it glares out too. And th these words should glare out, but we need to understand them in context. But Paul in other uh, places, he uses this as a uh, teaching uh, the submissive role of wives in the marriage. Uh, she has her existence out of Adam just like Christ. The church has its existence out of Christ. The church is the wife of Christ, the bride of Christ, and it's the product of the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. He formed the church. God chose them. Christ died for them. And just as Adam was by God put in a deep sleep and out of that which is a picture of death. And out of that, Eve was created. So the Lord Jesus Christ on Calvary's cross, he was put in a deep sleep called death. 
He died for sinners and that out of his death would come his church. So both the wife and the church have been formed out of their husbands. The scripture goes on to say the church has been made by God, the wife of Jesus Christ. And Paul, Paul the apostle here, by inspiration of the Spirit, he applies the grace of submission to the marriage relationship. Wives are to submit to their husbands. And look at it, verse 22. Now listen to this. This is, this is, this is important. Wives, submit yourselves unto your husbands as unto the Lord. Now that has as much bearing on the role of the wife in a marriage as it does the role of the husband. Because it teaches you this. Verse 23. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. So submit to your husband as unto the Lord. Now what does that tell you about the husband's role? He must be leading you as the Lord leads his church. And if he's not, there's problems. That's what happens. Leading his wife, leading his family as unto the Lord. So marriage between one man and one woman is to reflect the marriage of Christ and his church. And that's, that's key. Listen, modern day uh, ideas of marriage is so messed up. I mean, you know, you've got men wanting to marry men and uh, w women wanting to marry women. We, we watch that uh, Wheel of Fortune all the time. And uh, Pat Sajak, he'll ask the contestant, said, you have anybody with you? And the man said, I got my husband with me. You know? And I think, good night. What? Yeah. Well, the woman says, I got my wife. That, that, that is so ungodly. It is so sinful. Now, we're all sinners. Don't get me wrong. We're all, we all need salvation by grace. I mean, if you're saved, you're saved by grace through the righteousness of another. But that just so destroys the institution of marriage that God gave to Adam and Eve as a holy institution and what it's all, all about. And so the Lord has appointed the, all of this to reflect Christ and the marriage between a man and a woman. So he wrote here, look at it again, verse 22, "'Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord.'" That doesn't mean that the wife, the woman, is not an equal partner or a person. Uh, doesn't, doesn't destroy her, her role. You know, it's like any organization, any group. You know, when you have, you, you, when you have people brought together, you're going to have disagreements. Am I right? Well, somebody's got to make the final decision if you're going to get anything done. And here it's appointed that the husband would do that. And the wife is to submit. And it says, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands, your own husbands, not another's husband, but your own husband as unto the Lord. It's one man, one woman. What I always say it this way, one man, one woman, leaving and cleaving. <laughs> leaving mother and father. Your mother and father shouldn't be running your marriage. And cleaving to each other. And you become, as he says here, one flesh. And so he says, and this submission is as unto the Lord. The husband's the head of the home. That's what, that's what he's saying. He's appointed the husband to reflect Christ as the head of the family, even as Christ is the head of the church and he's the savior of the body. So as Christ joined himself to his church in covenant, the covenant of grace, the husband joins himself to his wife in the covenant of marriage, taking their vows before God and his people. And when a man and a woman are married, they become as one flesh. Not, not different, not, not separate. And regarding Christ and his church, we're all, listen, every true believer, we're all members of the body of Christ. And that by the grace of God, through the righteousness that Christ accomplished on Calvary. Isn't that right? And in neither situation is Paul meaning that one physical body, just, uh, 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 but uh, just a husband is now joined to his wife, we're also joined to Christ, but we're all one. That's my point. Just as a husband and wife are one. Christ is the surety of his church. That means he's responsible. And that's what a husband is for his wife. A surety. Just like Christ. Think about this. Back, back in the old days, they had to pay a dowry. And that's, that means they had to pay a dowry to the parents. Well, Christ paid our dowry. 
Christ, as the bridegroom, paid the dowry of his bride. And what was that dowry? It was just as satisfied for our sins under the law of God. He was made responsible. The main responsibility was put upon him. What's well, the same way with a husband and wife? He's to pay her dowry, in essence. It may not be a, a, a particular thing, but he's responsible to take care of her. And Christ sacrificed himself for the church. Look, look on here. He says, verse 23, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he's the savior of the body. Now, how did he save the body? He gave his life for the body. That's what he did. As, as, the, as the debt of the body was placed upon his shoulders, he came and he died to save that body, his church. And then as Christ supplies all the needs, of the body, the husband is to supply all the needs. Now notice I said needs. Did you hear that? Not all the wants, but he's to supply all the needs of his wife. But now go on, and, and, and like I said, this is not an inequality of persons. Both man and woman are equally person. You know, just like Christ. Christ became submissive to the Father for a purpose. And that was to save his people from their sins. But he was not unequal with the Father in every attribute of deity. He's equally God with the Father and the Spirit. But he took a lower office, a submissive office, in order to accomplish the salvation of his people. And so the wife is equal with the, with the uh, husband, but she takes a lower submissive office for the uh, furtherance of the family, of the marriage. Now we say equal, you know, we're talking about equal rights, equal persons. You know, the Bible says that in Christ there's neither male nor female. Does that mean that we're to not uh, recognize the difference between the genders and, and men can call themselves women now, and women can call themselves men? No, that's sinful. Does that mean that, uh, uh, but, but, there's an, there's an equality there in the body of Christ. It didn't take any more grace to save me than it did you. We're all equal, equally saved, equally graced, equally righteous, because our righteousness is the righteousness of another. Does that mean they're equal in everything? No. Sometimes the husband might be smarter than the wife. Sometimes the wife might be smarter than the husband. That's right. What does that tell you? That's husband, if you're going to lead well, you better listen to her. Maybe you don't do that always. But somebody's going to have to make the final decision. You know, today, they, they want to lie to themselves when they talk about men and women being equal. Look over at 1 Peter with me. 1 Peter chapter, let me see if I, if I can find that where I wrote it down. I think it's 1 Peter chapter... Three, yeah, go to 1 Peter chapter 3. I want you to listen to this. Peter says the same thing here. 1 Peter 3 and verse 1, Likewise, you wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. Talking about a husband leading in the word of God. While they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. That's, now, it's talking, what Peter's talking about essentially here is when you have one spouse is a believer and the other is not, that the husband ought to be leading in the word of God, or if the wife is the one who is a believer and the husband's not, she ought to be uh, 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 following that. It may be, we don't know for sure, it may be that the Lord would bring the unbeliever to be a believer, give him the gift of faith. But look at verse 3, whose adorning, let it not be the outward adorning of plating the hair and of wearing of gold and putting on of apparel. In other words, not, you know, just like in worship, you ladies when you dress, you men when you dress, you ought to dress modestly. Because you're not trying to draw attention to yourself. What are we here for? We're here to draw attention to Christ. That's what I want your mind, that's what I want my mind on. And so he says, but let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God great price. 
For after this manner, in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves, being in subjection unto their own husbands, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters you are, that is believing, that's what it's talking about, as long as you do well and are not afraid uh, with any amazement, likewise you husbands dwell with them according to the knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel. Now some people, they want to knock that weaker vessel, knock that out. And that's why you have uh, a lot of times you'll see girls wanting to be on the boys' football team and things like that. And it, it just doesn't work. Now, I, now, there are women who are stronger than me. I go to the gym, and I see there's women who want, they can lift a lot more. But I'm a 70-year-old man with arthritis. See? So if you, can weigh, if you can lift more than me, you don't have anything to brag about on me. Okay? But generally speaking, men are stronger than women. Generally speaking. But he says, And being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers not be hindered. In other words, that some, these things may not enter your mind and hinder your, your fellowship, hinder your worship, hinder your praying. All of these things. So now go back. Now, now what you're going to see here, I'm just going to read through and make a comment on some of these verses before I quit. But what you're going to see now, men, the greater responsibility to this marriage relationship is on us. It really is. Because he says, look at verse 25 again. Husband, love your wives as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Think about that. What kind of love is he talking about here? Love that compares with the love of Christ for his church? You know, that love is unconditional love. So no husband has a right to look at people and say, well, my wife doesn't deserve my love. Because I want to tell you something. The body of Christ, his wife, we have never deserved his love. Even at our best, we don't deserve his love. We've never earned his love. Herein is love, not that we loved him, but that he loved us and gave his son to be the propitiation for our sins. The sin-bearing sacrifice who brought satisfaction. Even when we were enemies, Christ died for the ungodly. Think about that. So this love is an unconditional love. Now I admit freely that I fall short of this, and you do too. But that's what we're to strive for. <laughs> that's the goal. What kind of love? It's a life-giving love. Christ gave his life to put away our sins. He didn't give his life because we deserve that. You know, Paul dealt with that in Romans 5. He said, for scarce for a righteous man, some would dare to die. But Christ died for the ungodly. Think about that. That's grace. He's the Savior of the body. Verse 24, Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let wives be to their own husbands in everything. Now, everything has to be qualified with the other scriptures. Everything that is godly. Everything that is lovely. Everything that is good. That doesn't mean that the husband has a right to be a tyrant. To be a slave driver. To not consider what she thinks and her opinions, her ideas. Now, when it comes down to making the final decision, though, somebody's got to make it. And that's where submission comes in. And, you know, there's nothing uh, uh, more uh, opposite to submission than self-love. So look at it. Verse 25, husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it. That's what Christ did for his church. He sanctified us. He set us apart from the world. And that's what a husband is to do. She, he's to set her apart. He's not to look at her like he looks at other women or other women like he looks at her. It's to be set apart. She's special. That's what, that's what Christ did for his church. And again, it wasn't because we deserved it or earned it. I keep saying that, but I think that needs to be drilled into our heads. 
So he sanctified, and then he cleansed it with the washing of water by the word. That's our regeneration and conversion. The new birth comes out of what Christ accomplished in his obedience unto death for our sins. He's given us life. He's given us faith. He's given us repentance. The word of God, that's, that's the key here. I told a lady one time who was asking me about marriage counseling. And she asked me if I, and she wasn't a member of the church, and I didn't even know her, but she'd seen me on TV, and she said, do you do any marriage counseling? And I said, well, probably not like what you're thinking of marriage counseling. I'm no psychologist. Uh, but I told her, and she asked me, she said, well, what do you mean? I said, well, if any couple comes to me, I usually tell them what the Word of God says, and usually that's the last thing that people want to hear. They don't want to hear that. They want validation. But he says washing of water by the word. It's the word of God that communicates grace to us, shows us who Christ is and who we are and how God saves sinners. In verse 27, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. See how Christ protects the church? See what goal he's bringing us to? Now, we are right now perfectly righteous in Christ based upon his righteousness imputed. But we're not perfectly righteous within ourselves, are we? We're sinners saved by grace. But he's going to bring us to that point where he's going to present us to the Father without blemish, without spot. Now, how does that apply to a husband? Well, husbands, we're to protect our wives. We're to protect their reputations. We're to protect them in, in our Speaking of them, dealing with them, to present them as someone special to us, to love them. You see what I'm saying? And that's, don't put them down in that sense. And so he says in verse 28, so ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. <laughs> that means as ourselves. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. You know, the, Bible, uh, the law says love, uh, love your neighbor as yourself. People put a lot of emphasis on self-love today to the point of going beyond the Word of God. They say, just, it doesn't matter if anybody, if anybody else loves you, just love yourself. Well, if, it, if nobody else loves you, it's because you're unloving. Now, again, I know we don't deserve God's love. None of us do. But in this marriage relationship, the husband is to think of his wife as he thinks of himself. In that loving relationship. For no man, verse 20, for no man yet ever hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. And that's the marriage relationship. Verse 30, he says, For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. What that's talking about is this the church, the bride, the wife of Christ, and Christ are one. Now, how are we one? Well, we're not equal in office. He's the Lord. We're the servants. He's the master. We're the servants. He's the Savior. We're the saved. He's the king. We're the subjects. But we're one in the eyes of God's law and justice. His blood has washed away my sins. He has given me a robe of righteousness that he worked out. But it's his given to me. And we're one in the eyes of God's law and justice. Verse 31, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. They're one. That's the marriage. One flesh. Husband and wife. Different offices, different responsibilities, but one person in God's eyes. And this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Think about that. Whenever I do a wedding, incidentally, I don't have to do weddings. You all know that, don't you? I don't have to do that. There's nothing in the Word of God that says a preacher has to perform a wedding. Or I don't even have to do a funeral. But I do them. And I enjoy, especially when two believers come together. But when a husband and when a man and woman want to get married in the side of, under the side of God, 
I enjoy doing that for the most part. Now, sometimes I don't. There's, there's some weddings I just soon forget. But, but on the whole, I enjoy doing that. But my point, my point is, is this. When I do a wedding, I always try to impress upon the couple is that your marriage is to be a reflection of Christ and his church. And if you keep that in mind, I think that would solve a lot of problems. I think that would uh, save a lot of money, too. That's, That's what it's to be. So look at verse 33. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. That is, give honor and submission and love, bring it all together, and you've got a marriage that reflects Christ and his church. Now, is that going to solve all our problems? No, it won't. But it'll help. Gives us something to think about and to strive for. And I think it's the key ingredient. I know it is. It's the key ingredient to any happy marriage. He said, it's a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and his church. Okay. Let's get our hymnals and turn to hymn number 126, sing Rock of Ages.